Jenny's had a, a, an introduction um, from Aurora, but there are a couple of things I want to add to that. And I was just going through trying to find, uh, I guess, sort of adjectives that I, 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 I've, I've seen use. And your own, you describe yourself as a visual search obsessive, uh, software engineer turned entrepreneur. I specialize turning uh, crazy ideas or, or gut reactions into products. Be interested to hear a little bit uh, more about that in a minute. And of course, we've got that expression, where is it? Geek. Chic CEO. Oh, I didn't How, point did that. Did you like one. that? <laughs> <laughs> that was someone who works at Snap. <laughs> was it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we can blame your company. Obviously. All right. Well, welcome. Um, we, as I said, we've got about uh, 25 minutes. I'll do it, and then I want to throw some uh, uh, questions out to you. Um, the, one th the way I often start is to ask you to, in 30 seconds, pitch your business. Tell us the way you pitch two VCs in a nice 30-second uh, rounded uh, piece. Uh, so that they understand exactly what it is you do. Sure. Um, so I run a company called SnapTech, um, which is basically a visual search technology platform. Um, so the idea is we take any content, um, any image, and turn it into a kind of lead for a product online. So our first product is Snap Fashion. So you can see literally anything you like. Um, so let's say a dress in a shop window. Take a photo on your mobile phone, and then we'll find you similar things to buy online. Um, and we take that technology, and we wrap it up, and we license it out to publications and to retailers as well. So for publications, it's all around the monetization of editorial content. Mm, so mm. if an editor has spent a week putting together this beautiful editorial gallery, everything sells out after two weeks, kind of how do we keep that content fresh? And that's where our visual search algorithms kind of kick in. And how is the business going? It's going well, yeah. Um, so we've been running officially for five years now, which is quite scary, right. um, unofficially about eight. And it's in a really kind of wonderful, fun scale up phase where um, We've grown it. Um, there's still only 15 people, um, but we've grown it to about 100,000 snaps a week, and we're really beginning to see people engage with the platform. So, I'm kind of uh, but as you, as you, the reason I ask how it's growing, and mm. I know you, you can't talk revenues and, and potential profits and, and w when when that's happening because I, I imagine you're not profitable yet are you? Uh, we're break even. We're you are break even. Okay. about profitable. But yeah. I, the reason I bring it up is because of course I've spoken to a lot of entrepreneurs who, who, who this this dream of, of creating something and then suddenly they are uh, uh, business leaders and yeah. they've got their head in business and their head in numbers and they're talking to investors about money. Mm -hmm. um, how difficult is that transition? It's really, really tough, especially like my background is engineering. So I, all of my um, business acumen has been, like I said, in the kind of bio on LinkedIn, it's all gut reaction. Um, so it's quite tough. You kind of learn a lot on the job and a lot of your job ends up kind of bluffing and having a bit of a poker face, to be honest, in investment meetings. A number of times I'm sitting and in my notebook, I'm like writing, Google what this means later <laughs> on. It's quite impressive. Um, so you kind of get used to that feeling there, and it's kind of what's so addictive about running a company is you know that every day you wake up and you're just going to have to yeah, learn something yeah. new and kind of roll with the punches. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll come on to funding a business like yours and how, how you manage to, to, to garner the interest and the support. But did you, did you have a lot of really frustrating meetings with VCs and potential investors? Yeah, I mean, our funding journey to date, so started the company officially in 2011, um, got funded by Innovate UK off the bat. Um, okay. So they, that organization is amazing. And because they look at the idea and they look at the R&D, they don't really look at the team and the person. So it was me at the time. Um, so I quickly had to go out, learn a lot about VC, and raise a small round from a VC based in London. Mm -hmm. Didn't know there were such things as angels, which was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a kind of small 300K round with them. Um, and then we actually spanned that funding for four years um, to break even point, which is probably the difference between running a company in kind of London versus Silicon Valley, where I could have raised way more and yeah, yeah. gone a bit kind of looser and freer with our revenue model from that kind of thing. Um, and then raised Series A last year, and I'm not going to lie, that was pretty tough. Right. Um, how so many how many re rejections did you get before you uh, before you got what you wanted? Probably about 100, really? 150. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. You have to get a thick skin, um, and there are so many euphemisms for why you're rejected. Um, so you have the um, you're very intelligent, which means we don't believe that you're going to run a business. You're a tech person. Um, we don't understand <laughs> what you're talking about. We don't really know about. what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> you get, um, oh, it's really nice to see someone so young into business, which is kind of 
this is your first company and that scares me witless, mm. which is kind of mm. fair enough. Mm. Um, you have, it's very brave to be a sole founder, which means I don't want you to get hit by a bus. There's not a co-founder. <laughs> so you begin to kind of learn how to interpret what they're all meaning. And so you kind of work and you build the team around you. And each rejection is an opportunity to learn. We, we of course, we've spoken a lot about women in, in setting up businesses yeah, as well, right. with Eileen with in particular. I mean, how much of a front did you come up with, uh, with uh, the... So it's quite rare that you come across an avert front. Um, if it's avert, it's normally a little bit sleazy and you mm. kind of back out of the situation incredibly quickly. Um, I won't name names on that one. Um, but I think there is just a massive gender bias in VC. I think it's only 6% of VC goes to females mm. at Series mm. A level. And a lot of that is there aren't that many women leading companies. Um, so it's naturally going to skew in that direction. But you've got this kind of investment bias of and I would completely understand it if I was an investor. You want to invest in someone who's like you because you can kind of see what you've been through because they've mostly had really successful careers or they've started companies. So they're kind of looking for that gut reaction of mm. why they mm. should back you. Mm. So if you're kind of similar, you've, you've already got that connection. Whereas yeah. if you're walking in as quite a different character, you can see why it takes a lot of confidence for them to, to get behind sure, you. Sure, sure. All right, let, let's, let's go back to the beginning when you're at Bristol University yeah. studying engineering. What, tell us how this whole thing grew, started. Where was the seed? How did it happen? You know, I've read stories that you're in a lecture theatres. You know, suddenly you came up with this great idea and yeah. you, you started writing algorithms, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Just t tell us all how this grew. I love the stories. I think I'm still like... Are they correct? <laughs> I'm, I think I'm still 18 in like every news article that's ever written. I'm going to stay that age forever. But um, no, I was at Bristol studying computer science. Um, I really wanted to be an animator, and that's kind of why I went there, because of Aardman Animations, really wanted to work for Pixar. Um, so naturally, kind of all my thinking, my logic is skewed towards the kind of visual side of computer science, so character and set design, animation. Um, stumbled across this sector called computer vision, which is basically um, how you can teach a computer how to see, which is, it sounds really kind of pedestrian and easy, but when you think about the visual kind of human system, it's the first thing you learn. Mm -hmm. So a kid mm -hmm. can point to a ball and go, that's a ball. To get a computer to do that, they don't have any of the context around it. So it's basically just a bunch of pixels and how do you make it interpret that? So I got really into that um, and my master's ended up being in computer vision and it was a content-based image retrieval system for fashion, which is pretty much snap fashion today. That, that was your thesis? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. So okay. Um, I came up with the idea, um, it was basically the year the iPod Touch launched, now I am showing my age. Um, and so all of my friends basically had a camera in their pocket. And I was like, this is such a powerful sensor and we're just using it to take selfies. It's ridiculous. Um, so I looked into visual search. She had Google goggles at the time um, yeah. who were there fantastic at doing like optical character recognition, wine bottles, DVD covers, but no one was doing the kind of soft object visual search, um, which was fashion. Um, so I think about why I'd use it and kind of seemed like a normal use case. And Spent a year writing algorithms, um, graduated with three options. So I had a, a PhD offer, had a job offer, and I had Snap. Um, and I was an absolute chicken, and I took the job offer. Um, did so you really? Yeah, okay. I did. Okay. It was 2009, and all the press was going, oh my god, no one can get jobs anymore. And I was sitting there, graduate job as a project manager, which was kind of well paid, really yeah, nice job, yeah. career path I thought I wanted. So I, I took that. Um, Naively thought I could run a business in my evenings. It's it's fine. It's and all this hard. was percolating in the background. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So evenings I go straight home after work. Work on Snap. Um, would work on the weekends. Then my my job were fantastic. They they let me go part time, just a year after joining on the grad scheme. So mm. I was doing mm. kind of, Talis for two and a half days a week. Snap for two and a half days. And then eventually I kind of handed in my notice and okay. just went tell, for it. tell me honestly, if 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 it hadn't been two thousand nine. Yeah. If it had been 2006, 2007, would you have made that same decision? Are you, are you, are you blaming your decision on the <laughs> crisis? Yeah, that's quite a big blame, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that, that was the main output of the economic crisis. Uh, no, it's, I'm naturally really risk averse. Um, so to be honest, 2006, I probably would have taken the PhD offer. Hmm. I think um, at the time, it's definitely beginning to change the perception of entrepreneurship, but it's not a career path. That's kind of how I always saw it. It was kind of this thing that happened to other people in California who had great ideas and mm, mm. that kind of thing. I didn't think it would be for me. Um, and also I've got this kind of impression of what a good entrepreneur is in my head. And for me, I don't tick any of those boxes. So it was quite a kind of big out of character leap of faith, I guess. To how, how, I mean, you, but you started it all whilst you were studying at Bristol. How, okay, you didn't make that decision to, to go for it 
you know, until after Talas, the, the job at Talas. But mm. how difficult is it to grow, to to grow a well, I say to grow a business, but to, to really bring this idea to fruition whilst being a student. Yeah. And I guess that will resonate with this. this yeah, pair. definitely. So I was incredibly lucky because of my engineering background. I could code up all the minimum viable products myself. So basically the reason that Snap <coughs> exists is um, I was coded all up, um, had them my working prototype for my thesis and lived with a load of female flatmates. And I was showing them what I'd done and they were like, Jenny, that's actually quite cool. I might use that. So then they told their friends and then we had a kind of group of about 40 or 50 people going, I'd really like to use it. So that kind of did the kind of product market fits mm, from a, mm. a consumer point of view. So I was able to then kind of do the designs myself, which looked horrible. I could do all the front end coding. So I could get it to a point where what we took to investors to raise seed was what I'd coded. And it was all off the back of that. It hadn't cost me a penny. Um, so that was really lucky um, from a point of view of running something from university. Um, and then Bristol also did an entrepreneurship award. Um, it was called the New Enterprise Awards. And it's basically open to undergrads, postgrads, mm. alumni. I should probably enter it again, actually, <laughs> give it a go. Um, and I was, um, I think, the second ever undergrad to win it because um, it's 15,000 pounds. And they don't normally just give 15 grand to someone with a big student debt because yeah, they don't really yeah, trust yeah, you to do the yeah. right thing with it, um, understandably. So um, yeah, that was another kind of great way that I could just get it off the ground. And that's how I had the comfort to go, you know what, I'm going to go part time sure. and just begin to invest but that. What about you know, at, at university, um, speaking to fellow students, to professors, to people at the university about about your ideas, mm. were they supportive of that, or did they say, "Look, Jenny, it's it's two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Um, get a real forget job. it. Go get a real <laughs> job. You know, we're not educating you to do this." Yeah, it was kind of a mixed reaction. Um, the lecturers and professors were really supportive. Um, I had a lot of people kind of disappointed that I took the job. I had, I'll always remember one of my professors, um, Hank Muller, came up to me and was like, you're wasting yourself going into project management. I was like, no, it's fine, I never have to code again, Hank, it'll be great. So you had the professors kind of going, you should really be doing this business. And then my friends, they keep you grounded, don't they? I had yeah. people who go, oh, you, you're just going to put in an image and you'll just find red hats for everything. And I still have <laughs> friends who phone me up today going, have you finished your degree yet? So <laughs> that's the kind of the thing that you expect, I guess. OK, so so you decide to go for it after Talis or wh whilst you're there. Yeah. And, and uh, you get your, your you go to the initial meetings with, with investors. Uh, 100 rejections, things go well. What, what, what are you thinking then at that stage? What's the, what's the next goal for you on this journey? Um, so it's quite interesting. When you raise funding, you've got kind of two massively conflicting emotions. So you have the, oh my God, I've done it. This is amazing. And I get to grow my team and I get to disseminate my technology to the world. And then you've got the other half of you going, oh my God, like the business plan, I've got to deliver the business plan. So you have that kind of day of feeling really relieved and then you're like straight into, I've actually got to make this work. Um, so the first thing for me was getting a team. Um, and I'm always a big <coughs> fan of kind of know your strengths and know your weaknesses. So um, when it was the first round of investment, I was like, right, I need a really, really solid web developer because mm -hmm. I'm C++. Um, so I hired my friend out of uni who I knew was fantastic. Um, same with someone to do operations because I'm horrifically disorganized, as poor Aurora knows, um, organizing this. Um, so it's kind of building up that initial team. And then that's exactly what I did for Series A as well. So the first person I hired was a COO, who's actually my, my boss in my first job, which oh, is exactly. a lovely dynamic, yeah. Um, so it's all about kind of bringing in people that you know will grow it better than you would in, in those areas. And what about, I mean, it's, you know, it's, I ask this selfishly, what about PR and communications? Yeah. How important is that? Because you know you come at this from a from an engineer um, perspective. You're writing algorithms. Okay, you bring on a CEO. You bring on web designers. But you need to tell the world about this business, right? Yeah, it's so important. It's unbelievable. Um, so we were really lucky. The day after we launched Snap to the world, I kind of had done the tech bit, and I was like, great, it's launched. Right, I've got to actually make people um, find out about this. So my sister's a journalist, um, so she was able to kind of write all the press releases. We got coverage in places like Vogue and mm. they were in the Evening Standard. They were a kind of two big ones. Um, and then we won the Cisco British Innovation Awards. Um, and that was a lot of press. I was reading the Metro in the morning and over someone's shoulder and then saw my face looking at me, which is always a horrible <laughs> surprise. Um, so you had that kind of thing going on. Um, so we've never paid for um, publicity. Um, it's always been quite organic, um, but we're going to ramp up and do a big paid campaign this year. So 
will finally have snap fashion on the And of course, phones. then when you exit and then when you list eventually, you're going to have to bring in IR and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Or am I jumping the gun here? I'm going to have to do media training. It's going yeah. to be... Um, the, the media <laughs> training, exactly, yeah. exactly. Now, you, you in, 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 the, in the press, your press release, you acknowledge, um, you obviously acknowledge the pr proliferation of, of fashion tech startups. Yeah. But, but you were the first in a way to do it. But does that count anymore at this stage? Because That's in this sort of doggy dog yeah. world, um, it doesn't really matter that you were the first, right? Yeah, I, I hate saying this. I kind of wish I was second because there's a lot right. of things I've messed up along the way. And if I was my competitors, I'd be sitting there going, I'm not going to do that. Um, so I think being second is actually quite a good thing. Um, it helps my ego once in a while to be able to say I'm first, <laughs> um, but that's not great from a business point of view. But um, I think it's honestly having the long-term plan is the most important thing. I think there are points along the kind of five years we've been going where I could have had a lot of quick wins and it would have damaged the business in the long term. And I'm quite pleased I've kind of held out. Um, lots of people come up to me and they go, oh, snap, it's quite old now, isn't it? And I kind of see that as a, a bit of a badge of honour in a way. Um, right. like we've had opportunities to exit that we didn't take and we've had opportunities to partner with people where the revenue opportunities weren't right or the branding wasn't right and trying to play the long game with the business. And but what, what is the long game though? Um, I mean, how do you, you know, in, in terms of what you started with and what you described at the beginning and the way you can, you, you spot a piece of, of, of clothing and apologies if I'm, um, if I'm making this sound too crude, you know, you, you take that picture and then you, you, you get all the other uh, suggestions from other retailers, et cetera. Yeah. What, what's next? Where, where can you take this? So recently we changed the name of the company from Snap Fashion to Snap Tech and that kind of shows the direction that we're going in because my pitch always started with, we're called Snap Fashion but actually we're a tech company. Okay. Um, so the idea is to take this kind of technology platform that we have and try and roll it, roll it out as widely, as widely as possible. And it sounds quite crude to pitch it in this way but the quick way of saying it is kind of we want to be, you know when you're typing in, you're sitting in front of a keyboard and you go I'm just going to Google it. Mm. That would be my absolute joy is if you're walking past something you'll get out of your phone and go oh just snap it and it's that right. kind of automatic reaction of anything you see would be snappable really. right and that so that's that's what you're aiming for yeah exactly. but how do you get there though um little goals in the interim so kind of fashion's our first market then we're looking <coughs> at other kind of consumer verticals um so beginning to kind of branch out the technology in different directions not being too wide um i think that could kill you and there are other people doing it just as well so like vivina are amazing at wine bottle yeah. search you've yeah. got i use that one yeah, it's really, really awesome. So there's no point in reinventing the wheel. We should be partnering, not going head to head. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other one is partnerships. Um, so visual search, you're educating people constantly because it's not a natural thing to get out your mobile phone and point it at something at the moment. Mm. So if you can partner with big brands that already have that reach and the ability to educate those users, then that's the way that we can get people. So is that your way of telling us that that's what you're going to be doing? We're going to see you guys partnering with big names yeah, uh, that's right. over um, the next uh, few years. Yeah, so I mean, our first partnership was weirdly in Singapore um, with Singtel, um, which didn't quite see the light of day, which is really disappointing. Um, but then we partnered with Westfield um, doing kind of in-store visual search and shopping malls. Um, and now we've partnered with Time Inc. Um, so that's all around that kind of editorial content as inspiration. Um, so we're live on InStyle, Marie Claire, Look, mm. and going to be launching something with them soon as well. So. Brilliant. Yeah, it's the and, and you, you've got 15 people working for you now, yeah. but you are looking mm -hmm. to expand that to, you said 20 or yeah, something? Yeah, 20, 25. I'm taking okay. the kind of Instagram approach to a team. Um, I always think that if you've got a software platform, you shouldn't need that many people to grow into a massive business. Mm. She says, touch wood, you can <laughs> quote this at me in a few years' time if you want. I've got people problems. Um, but no, we've um, got a core tech team of about 10 people, going to grow it to 15, so adding a few more people into computer vision, because up until two weeks ago, I was still the only person doing computer vision in the company, which is <laughs> kind of wow. scary. Yeah. Um, add that to a reason to be rejected for funding, by the way. Um, uh, is that right? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, They're just getting kind of hit by the bus thing. Yeah, and, and the bus. I don't go near buses anymore. Um, but yeah, just kind of growing up the tech team a bit more and having a bit more redundancy in the team as well. So if someone's sick, then yes. you don't have a yes. big problem. Um, when I'm always interested in this. When, when you know, has it, has it happened yet? And maybe it has, but that, that moment when this becomes... Uh, it goes from being a, a, a passion, um, a, a, a trying to make, bring your idea alive... Uh, to a real business where you think this is a really, really lucrative way of making a living. Mm. 
have you reached that point? Um, do you remember reaching that point if you have? Yeah. Uh, are you looking forward to it if you haven't? I think there are a few points that you hit. So the first one is when you can actually pay yourself, which is an amazing day because I went for like two years without paying myself and living with my parents and God right. knows how they put up with me. So that's like when you feel like you're beginning to start a real business. Then you have the, oh my God, I've just employed someone and it's suddenly like you've got children. I've got like 14 <laughs> kids and I need to put food on the table and this is terrible. So you have that kind of sense. Um, I think break even was the point where we felt like we were a real business because definitely in visual search and kind of horrible generalization, but tech startups in general, it takes you a very long time to reach break even point. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just got the model of, we're just gonna acquire users, we're gonna get data, or worry about revenue later. Um, and we took a conscious decision to be like, right, we've got to worry about revenue now and keep the lights on. So that was when I felt like we had a real business. Mm. Um, and I'm looking forward to the inflection point when, for me, it'll be like when we've got a million users a month, that will be when How we many know have you got that now? we've got about 100,000 um, snaps a week at the moment. So we're, we're getting okay, there. You're getting there, yeah. Yeah, so, but I think when you can kind of say that something I invented at uni is now used by a million people every month, that's quite a cool, yeah. cool point yeah. to be at. And in terms of, Again, I'm sorry, the, the journalist uh, in me is going to push this, but in terms yeah. of sort of revenue goals for you and when yeah. you, w what, what, what's that point you, you feel successful based on a revenue target? Oh, um, so I would like, to, so at the moment we're breaking even. Hmm. Um, I would like to be making around a million profit before I felt successful. Okay. Um, How far off is that? I'm going to say a year. I'm going to really? put myself on the line. Um, so wow. yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a few contracts. I think one of them is public, so I can go for it. Um, so we've got a contract to put Snap into fitting rooms. Um, and that's a nice kind of million pound contract, which is always a, that's the biggest one we've ever won. Um, so we're kind of getting there. Mm. But um, mm. I'd like to turn it more into profit and less about breaking even. Sure. Um, you, you, you mentioned living with your parents. You know, it's quite a nice segue into the, the sort of support young entrepreneurs mm. need to have um, to, to, to make this work. You know, you mentioned your parents is one thing. You know, I'll mention an, another uh, 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 support that I know you've had, and that is from a guy called Bob Shukai, who actually works for, for Thomson Reuters yeah, on, the, right. on the tech side. You met him through Twitter. Yeah. Um, how important, you know, rather than going into Bob himself, um, how important is it to have an advisor like that um, for someone like yourself in, in running a business like this? Yeah, massively important. So I think the first thing is, if it is your first business, or even if it's your second or third, you're always going to come across stuff that you haven't seen before that someone else has. So I've tried, like Bob has been absolutely amazing at having perspective on kind of the US and the kind of tech scene as a whole. Then I've got an advisor, um, Bill Sermon, he used to be head of UX for Nokia. So if I'm doing something with the product, he'll be like, Jenny, that's stupid, no one's going to use it. So he's really, really useful for that. So you end up kind of building up advisors in mm. different pockets of and the industry. And this is all free advice. Exactly, yeah. And um, they're just people that you can phone if you're having a massive crisis of confidence, which matters a huge amount, especially if you're a sole founder. Um, and that's kind of the other side of it is it's quite a psychologically stressful thing to put yourself through building a company because it's kind of 24 seven stress. It's quite hard to turn off your head, if, especially if you're kind of really, really into your company and kind of mm, obsessive mm, about it. Mm. And it's quite lonely to be honest. Yeah. Like um, you end up doing bizarre things that you can't really tell your friends about because- <laughs> Can they, you tell us about them? <laughs> like, th it, it makes you seem like an idiot, right? But like, oh, I, I got an MBE. That instantly like just makes people go, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, same like I've been to Iceland with David Cameron on a private jet to talk to some prime ministers. And you, you can't say that thing to your friends in the pub because it just seems like you're boasting. So, um, or I they think just don't believe or you. Or they don't believe you. That's <laughs> probably that actually. So you end up having like a small network of other startup founders who mm. are seriously the most valuable advisors you can get as well. It's you know, you, you mentioned the government and uh, you know, we mentioned uh, London Technology Week and you know, we mentioned Eileen Burbage because of course she, she runs, mm. well, she's the government's um, liaison or advisor uh, on, on tech. Um, how much support, how, and let me put it this way, how supportive is the UK government, really? Um, I mean, we hear a lot from the government, from mm. David Cameron and others, about how important this is. But you know, when you look at the numbers and you compare our London to, say, Berlin or Tel Aviv or Silicon Valley, you know, how, how much support do you really get? So I can only speak personally, mm. but it, 
it has been incredibly useful for me. So Innovate UK was the reason that, so they gave us that initial 100,000 funding before a VC had even put money in. So that was what let me kind of give up my job and, and start going at it. So I think the kind of government bodies are incredibly useful. Same with UKTI, we've done trade missions to Malaysia, Singapore. Um, I think uh, the, oh my goodness, I can't forget their names. The British Council, um, the Centre okay. to Brazil yep. as well to do some yep. market sizing. So you've got all the kind of offshoots of the government, which are incredibly helpful and obviously they're all funded and kind of influenced by them. Um, I've got a lot personally out of the government just through, I don't know how, but I've become, probably because I'm not that bolshy, they kind of come to me for advice once in a while and I ask them for advice, so mm. kind of got a good back and forth, but I'm not sure how widespread that is to other entrepreneurs. I okay. might just be incredibly lucky okay. on that one. I, I'm going to come on to the advice they're, they, 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 they're trying to get from you on the referendum. You didn't oh have one minute think we weren't <laughs> going to talk about the referendum. Uh, I'll come on to that in just a second. But you, another thing that I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about, co-working space, yeah. um, Shoreditch, uh, um, tech, tech City, you know, Google Campus, all these things. You know, some amazing spaces there yeah, that, that I've I've seen. And you were in one of these spaces, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, how important is that? You know, having other like-minded people doing, trying to set up their own businesses and sharing ideas. Massively important. So I was in Ideal London, which is run by UCL, Cisco, and DC Thompson. Mm -hmm. um, and there were basically ten companies in there, and we all grew to about six, eight people before we were all kind of released into the world like real grown-ups. Um, but that was amazing just for kind of meeting the founders and those kind of networks. So I've ended up with kind of three or four friends that will kind of be friends for life and we always phone each other up when things are going wrong. So that was the most valuable thing definitely to mm. come out of incubators. Mm. I think some are better than others and some of them kind of, I think different What, what makes a really good one as opposed to a bad one? Um, it's the quality of companies in them, to be honest. Um, so if quality, you, not quantity. Yeah, quality, quality yeah. definitely. Um, so if you go into one that's been really highly curated, like, for instance, Cisco at the moment have a drive for IoT companies to go into Ideal London. So if you're running an Internet of Things company, that's the place to be. Mm. Um, same with, I think, tech hubs do quite a good job of kind of, I hate to say it, if an office is quite pricey, it probably means you've been funded. So you've already been through that kind of... Right fairly rigorous due diligence process through all the investors, so you end up getting a higher quality of people. Mm, mm. Um, but office space is getting way too expensive, in my opinion, in Shoreditch as well. When you've got places charging £550 a desk, that's when you think, do I want to be sitting in a room full of entrepreneurs that think that that is a good use of money? So right. I think right. different spaces attract different kind of people. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Let's, let's talk about the referendum then briefly. Um, David Cameron, well, the government came to you uh, uh, among others. And others, yeah. Um, <laughs> Not just me. <laughs> so, Jenny, worry. help us, please. Um, and and said, said, look, how do we get young people to vote? Yeah. And you, um, you, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I know, you know this We is all heard again. that, I'm sure you're all aware of this whole Boaty McBoatface campaign that happened uh, uh, several months ago, um, which I think was thrown out. But you came up with this Boaty McVoteface thing. Right. Yes. Now you, <laughs> you you sort of sink back in your seat when I say it. How come? Um, so as did it work? We yes don't know or yet, no. Right? Um, so <laughs> as you may have noticed, my sense of humour is quite irreverent and quite flippant. So I was just sitting around the table, and literally there was like Google, Apple, Facebook, Uber. I was feeling quite intimidated as Snap Fashion on the table, and you could see people looking at me, going, "Why on earth is she here? Like, <laughs> she shouldn't be here." So we were talking about kind of mechanisms that we had to vote. So Facebook were going, great, like I'm going to put a button here and it will say I've registered. And same with Google saying like we can change the kind of Google lettering and it will be a mechanic to remind people to register to vote. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there going, I've got 100,000 people. You've probably got about 100,000, God knows what. Um, so I said, we should be talking about the message. Um, and I just flippantly said, we should do voting at vote face. That would be hilarious. Ended up getting a high five from the advisor. I was like, oh God, what have I done? <laughs> so I sent them an email going like, I'm about to unleash voting at vote face on the world. Speak now, forever hold your peace, because this could go either way. Um, and it did go either way. So we had the young people kind of laughing at it, going like, this is hilarious. Um, we had a lot of journalists getting really angry with me, going, you're patronising young people. I don't believe a room full of PR executives who are all 60 and don't understand young people are doing this. And I was sitting there on Twitter going, I'm 28 and I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, so that was obviously a good argument. Um, but yeah, it's, it's yeah. been quite interesting. Yeah. It ended up on, on Have I Got News For You. Yeah. 
which well, is like a life goal. So Ian again. has looked after me. So um, how uh, you know I, I I can't show my colours on this this uh, this uh, vote. Um, but how? Let me pose a question like this, and maybe you'll see my colours. But how bad will it be for <laughs> <laughs> entrepreneurs um, in this country um, if we leave Europe? Um, it will be bad. Um, I'm not going to lie. So. Um, at the moment, half of SNAP is European. Um, so it does scare me that if we do vote to leave, what happens to all the people in Britain at the moment? What happens to visas, all of that kind of thing? It's amazing and it's something that I take mm. for granted mm. when I'm hiring is like, oh cool, this person's from Germany. They come up for SNAP. Whereas if someone applies from America, I have to sit there and go, well, they're amazing, but like, obviously we've got the visa program coming in, but it adds costs and it adds complexity and actually I'm just gonna go for this person from Germany. So. I think we take that massively from, for granted um, and also just the ability to trade freely and I also think it just sends a really sad message mm. to bright intelligent people from Europe who are over here in the UK even if they don't have to leave we're kind of sending the message of you're not particularly welcome and no one really wants to hear that so mm. Um, mm. yeah mm. I'm and you can tell which side I'm falling yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, yeah. <laughs> and and th I mean I don't want to delve too much into this but do you buy the government's economic arguments? Uh, yes. But um, I think you can pick holes in, in either side on the economic arguments. Um, where I stand on it is, obviously, what we're in at the moment isn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But I think it's incredibly easy to sell a story saying how much better something's going to be. Because it's that compelling thing of, like, what if we did this? It's, mm, it, mm, it's mm. always an easy kind of play to make. Whereas when you're in something and you can see the holes and you can see that there is cash flow issues around the place, it's, it's very hard to paint a, a rosy picture of what it will be like if we stay. Mm, um, mm, it's, mm. Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, just before we go to, to uh, the audience for their questions, um, you, uh, the, 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 the picture you've painted is a, is a, I mean, it's a very positive picture, your journey, and, and you know, started and you were writing the algorithms, and it sort of came together pretty nicely. Okay, you said you had 100 rejections. <laughs> let's, let's not forget that. But was, was there ever a moment where you thought, you know what, I've really, really done the wrong thing here. I've got to get the hell out of here because this is not going to work. Um, or I just can't stand the, the, the <laughs> pressure of this. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've never had that horrible crunch point where I've gone, oh my God, I've done the wrong thing. But every day you're screaming inside. And I think it'd be wrong if you weren't because you've given up a job and you're putting yourself on the line and you're providing employment for loads of other people and that's mm. stressful and I mm. think that if you weren't worried about that you'd be a quite insane person to be honest. Um, so I think like starting a company is probably one of the scariest things you can do and one of the most isolating so yeah you wake up probably every morning you have a point every time in the day you went oh if I just work for Google. Life but the inspiration and the dream of doing yeah. it must outweigh that worry and that stress, yeah, otherwise exactly. you wouldn't still be doing it, right? Yeah, and I think loads of people, it's quite hard for me to say kind of, because I know myself too well, but loads of people when they chat to me they go, you can tell that you're still like massively passionate about this five years in, and that's kind of yeah. what keeps me ticking. And I think I was saying to you earlier, I make sure that a day a week or two days a week I spend time with the product, I do some coding, because um, that's a bit of the job that I love. And I'd be sad if I just kind of gone into finance and spreadsheets and HR and mm. fundraising. I need to keep my hand in product to carry on enjoying it. That's kind of what keeps me, keeps me going. Jenny Griffiths, everyone.